we're going to be looking at an introduction to the Bluetooth low energy RFI testing. So that's the lowest layer on the BLE side. So firstly, the Bluetooth SIG and specification. So uh, the SIG's a global community. There's over 36,000 companies and they have a few remits there. That they're trying to expand the Bluetooth technology by having member collaboration and they create new and improved specifications all the time to drive the global Bluetooth interoperability through their qualification programs. And they try and grow the Bluetooth brand so PR exercise in effect by increasing awareness, understanding and adoption of the Bluetooth technology. And the if you want the URL for them is just bluetooth.com. There's four main documents that you need to perform the RFI testing. The first and most important of these is the RFI specification, which is a test suite. So this has taken the requirements from the core specification and turned them into a number of test cases to verify compliance. And these test cases include the test procedures and processes and the expected outcomes, which is a pass criteria. The second is the TCRL, which is a test case reference list. Um, this is a spreadsheet and it lists the test equipment that can be used to officially validate a product and also a list of the test cases per category. And the tests are split into two categories in the RFI specification. There's category A, which as you can see in the table here, must use validated test equipment and be formed by a certified lab. And then category B, where the test equipment can be defined by the manufacturer and evidence has to be held so that those tests can be repeated again at a later time. And thirdly, we have the ICS document, which declares a device under test or DUT's capabilities. That's used to select which tests are applicable to a product. So it include things like if it's got a transmitter and or receiver, and if it supports stable modulation. And then finally, the exit. This defines parameters, which allows a test to be able to complete testing on a product. So it might contain things like the maximum supported packet length for the transmitter and the receiver and the source voltage that's used to power the, the kit. On previous iterations, there used to also be things like normal operating conditions and temperature and humidity ranges, but those are not tested anymore for the RFI. So just a little background on, on BLE. So we do, we do uh, have done webinars and training on Bluetooth Low Energy in a bit more detail, but these are just the top level parts that you'll need for this to understand the RFI. So it's split, Bluetooth Low Energy is split into 40 channels that space two megahertz apart, and it uses GFSK frequency modulation where the bits are encoded into frequency shifts of the carrier frequency. So you have a carrier per, frequency per channel when you're transmitting on that channel. And what you do is because it's an FM scheme, you increase or decrease that frequency of the carrier and that's encoding the data bits. So let's move on to describe the types of signals. Firstly, some definitions. So the carrier frequency, this is the carrier for the channel that's being used. It carries a modulated signal and it's usually down converted to a low frequency at the receiver. And for Bluetooth LE, the carrier is modulated in frequency to indicate a one or a zero. So a one is a positive frequency shift. So you're increasing the frequency of the carrier and zero is a negative frequency shift. So you're dropping the frequency of the carrier. And this will be a little bit clearer in some of the slides I've got later on. Then symbol timing is a deviation of that bit. So you're encoding a bit stream into those frequency modulations. The symbol timing is really a deviation from where you're expected a, a bit to appear and that's measured in ppm or parts per million and resolution bandwidth so a lot of tests are done there are power measurements maybe done on a spectrum analyzer or the tlf 3000 and that's really a bandpass filter so on the measurement side it describes the width of the filter around the center measurement point and again moving on with the definitions we have intermodulation so intermodulation is caused when you've got two or more signals and the receiver is not linear. So basically any real world receiver. And obviously frequencies have harmonics that you may be aware of, but you also have additional interactions between the frequencies. So you can see in the bottom left here, we have two frequencies of signal that have been transmitted, F1 and F2. And 
of all the distortion frequencies, the third order one is of the most interest because that's the nearest to these frequencies. So obviously you'd have harmonics, like for F2 you'd have two, two lots of F2 and F1 you'd have two F1 as well. And you get these third order distortion components that are in red here on the diagram at two F1 minus F2 and two F2 minus F1. You can also see that we've got what's called an image frequency. So when a receiver converts a receive signal to a lower frequency, it mixes it with a local oscillator frequency, and that allows the required frequency in, but also a frequency that is mirrored around the local oscillator. So again, in this diagram, we've got the local oscillator by the indicated by the blue arrow, and then we have this wanted signal, but you have an image signal, and it's called that because it's mirror image around that local oscillator. And that's indicated by this uh, red dotted line. So that mirrored signal you've got to allow for at the receiver and make sure it can reject that, usually done by a filter at the receiver side. So after the definitions, we look at the different types of signal and how they can be summarized as the LE characteristics. The wanted signal, which is what you're using to test, and that can also be can be changed to be what's called a dirty transmitter. Then you have adjacent channel interferers and a CW interferer, which is continuous wave, uh, which you can think of as a, a sine wave. So Bluetooth LE signals got several characteristics. These are the symbol rates. So in other words, if you're encoding one megabit or two megabits. It can be uncoded or coded with S is two, S is eight. So coded is where you drop in the signal data rate because you're trans uh, transmitting multiple symbols per bit. That drops the rate, but it gives you an advantage in that it's more immune to errors. So you increase in the range. Constant tone extension, which is used in location as the um, angle of arrival, angle of departure. And then stable modulation, which basically has tighter limits on the allowable modulation frequencies, which again improves performance. So for this webinar, all the information that follows will be for one meg uncoded, which is the column indicated in yellow here. The tests are the same, but the parameters and limits change for the various test cases. So you can see here which test cases are in the spec, and these are the category A test cases. So you've got the one meg, which we're going to cover, then two meg, uh, whether it's got stable modulation and whether it's ports, S is two or S is eight coding. But as I said, we're going to concentrate on the yellow column here. So another essential requirement is the direct test mode. So this allows us to control a product's transmitter to run the transmitter tests. And it also gives us a packet count to allow us to verify how many packets of the product correctly receives. So this is the only way we can test the receiver really. And the DTM allows for connection either over HCI or through a 2 UART test interface as shown here. Then the types of signal, the wanted signal, this is just really a Bluetooth LE signal that we're sending to the product's receiver. So in the real world, this would be the device that it's trying to exchange information with. And for this signal, we're turning off whitening, we're turning off frequency hopping. So we're just looking at one channel at a time. We tend to use for most of the tests maximum power, and then it has three different payload types, either a PRBS9, which is a pseudo random bit sequence, which repeats every two to the nine minus one bits, or an alternating bit pattern, ones and zeros, or four ones, four zeros. And that wanted signal is sometimes varied, so it's within the limits of the transmitter specification, but at those limits. And that's what's known as a dirty transmitter. So to the wanted signal, we add fixed parameter values such as frequency offset of the carrier, the modulation index, and symbol timing error. So you can see the ranges here for those three items. And what we do is called fixed frequency offset is because we'll fix along those that range of parameters. And we'll pick different combinations within that range, test it for we'll transmit 50 packets with that, then another 50 packets with a different set, then another 50 packets and so on. And we'll cycle through those different parameter values. And in addition to the fixed frequency offset, we also add a frequency drift over time. So that's given by the, the diagram here. And that's 
implemented by adding a low frequency modulation to the signal. Now that modulation is at 1250 Hertz, as you can see here, and it has an amplitude of plus or minus 50 kilohertz. So what we're doing is, is drifting the carrier frequency according to this sine wave here. Then as well as the wanted signals, there's two main types of interferer. One is LE modulated signal. So that simulates LE signals from other devices within the area and the continuous wave interferer. So for the simulated LE signal, it has a PRBS 15 pan, so a slightly different payload. And that can be co-channel with the interferer is within the same channel or adjacent channel, which is another channel within the LE band. Then the image frequency, which we talked about before. So we simulate the that mirror image frequency. And then also the continuous wave interferer, which can be anywhere from 30 megahertz up to 12.75 gigahertz.